Uh, so thanks, and thank you all for coming. Um, so my normal talk is about 20 minutes, and it's about companies, etc. So this is a little different. So I'm going to wing, be winging it a little bit. It's, so I want to talk more generally, not too much about why I think it's good. And it's a little bit longer, a lot longer. So jump into the questions as much as you want. Uh, so but first I should talk a little about what, who is Homer? Um, oh, sorry. Told me. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, um, so um, it's not a cartoon character. It's it's not a Greek poet. It's a piece of software. It stands for Hybrid Optimization Model. Uh, and so at NREL, we were um, Bush Senior went down to the Earth Summit in Rio in in '92 and said we're we're going to use renewable energy to help the world. Uh, and he came back and to us and said, okay, well, figure out something to do. So we came up with the Village Power Program, recognizing that there were, at the time, there were two billion people in the world without power, which means they didn't have anything, really. They didn't have clean water, they didn't have communication, they, they didn't have teachers for the schools or nurses for the health clinics or anything. And they weren't going to get it by conventional means. Uh, and so we were ahead of our times, which is appropriate for research lab, we recognized that re renewable power was the way they were going to get power, and we just had to figure out how. And it, renewable power doesn't really, well, solar and wind don't really stand on their own. They have to be part of a hybrid system. So that's the H in hybrid. In Homer, O is for optimization. Uh, and so in the 90s, that was a great pr program. In the late 90s, we converted it into a Windows app, put it on the web, let people download it. It kind of took off. Um, in the wider world, and in the 2000s, the Department of Energy lost interest in helping poor countries, et cetera. Um, so uh, we kind of struggled on. I've got Steve Dre was with me at the time, and he, he left NREL sooner than I did uh, to go off on our own. We were getting a lot of interest from the private sector, and NREL is, is, is all about getting money from the Department of Energy. So uh, eventually it made sense to spin off in 1998, basically. Um, and really, um, the market is really global. It's, much, it's not really the lower 48 at all. So uh, we do a fair amount, a lot of work in Alaska, Hawaii, for, in islands all over the world. Um, and, and, and actually, I saw a statistic, something like 90% of all of the new power co generation ca capacity is going to be installed in developing countries because we're, we're not growing that fast and, and in fact our energy consumption is falling because we're getting more efficient but the developing countries they don't have the infrastructure to begin with and they're growing really fast so that's where power is needed the most and that's where we work the most but um, but there's some big changes that ha need to happen here as well so um, What's the goal, you know? So we're, we're in the middle of this transition from the old way of making power, which was big centralized plants that burned fossil fuels, emitted a lot of pollution, um, to clean distributed power. So um, I've been doing this since the 70s, since, since I was an undergrad. Right, and I, you know, I went to a college where I had to write a thesis, read college, and, then, and my thesis was about this topic. In the 70s, you know, that was the first wave kind of, of um, interest in clean energy, or we didn't call it clean energy at the time, but whatever. Uh, and so um, we, it's gone through these waves, et cetera. Uh, in a way, you can think of distributed power has many advantages, which I'm going to talk about as we go. It's cleaner. Um, it's more reliable. It's also returning the power. It's decentralized, so there's, there's an equity issue there as well. So th there's a lot of advantages to it, but it's a, it's a really big change, and, and it's, there's a really legitimate question of how do we get there. Uh, so uh, that's what I'm going to be talking about. Well, why do we want to change? What, so what's wrong with the status quo? So I've got my obligatory you know, polar bear picture about climate change, uh, and that's obviously a, a major motivator. 
Um, but, and, and, uh, and I've got a, a headline there about um, the conflict between um, distributed solar and the traditional utility model, uh, which is what I'm going to talk about quite a bit. But I also really like this slide. This is from Quebec. It was quite a while ago, about 10 years ago, an ice storm brought down. Those are very big high voltage lines, and it brought down a, a whole lot of them. Uh, the grid is really vulnerable. Uh, it it's, runs along the countryside. It's wide open. Uh, and it's a centralized system, which is inherently vulnerable. Um, and that vulnerability has been brought into sharp relief in the last month about a month ago, um, and nobody really knows who did this or why, but these, in the middle of the night, these folks in San Jose, California, pulled up to a substation with automatic weapons and for, I don't know, a minute or two, just peppered this substation with, with automatic weapons and drove off. Nobody's caught them, brought down the substation. And it turns out there aren't that many facilities to make those big transformers, the, 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 the really big ones. And FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, did a, did a analysis, and if you did that to nine substations, you could bring down the whole country. And if you simultaneously did it to the one factory that makes those transformers, it might take two years to, re to I mean, we'd, that would be catastrophic to, to recover. So ev evident, I always thought that transmission lines were the real vulnerability because they're out in the open and they run, you know, they're pretty easy, they're pretty open. This, um, turns out it's, it doesn't take that long to repair a, a You'd think it would, I don't know. It's kind of amazing they can fix those in a couple of weeks. But the transformers, evidently, there aren't that many places that make the really big ones. So, so that was a new vulnerability that, that um, and there's other vulnerabilities. A lot of people worry about um, solar weather, space weather, about you know, solar flares or uh, coronal mass eruptions, they're called. That uh, in 1848, there was one big enough to start fires in telegraph stations. So if we had one like that today, um, and then there's terrorist attacks, there's all kinds of things. Every couple of years, we have a, re a regional blackout. So, and almost all of those outages are not caused because we don't have enough generation. They're caused because of disturbances in the distribution system. So there's nothing that you can do on the generation side of the transmission to, to make the system more reliable. If the problem is in between you and the generators. The only way to be more reliable is to put the generators near the load. So that's what distributed generation is all about. Um, you know, I, I don't, I didn't actually read the study, to be honest. Um, what I assumed it was, was no, I actually, I did, I did read this part of it. It was four, so there's, the North American continent is really four systems, east, west, Texas, and Quebec. And so, and I don't know about Quebec, so I don't think they counted Quebec in that study. But um, there were four in the east, three in the west, and two in Texas. So I think they just strategically located them to, to cover the country. So I don't, I don't know the... Well, big substations, though. But yeah, it, it must have created some kind of cascading effect. M utilities have this thing, N minus one contingency. They've got enough reserve capacity online spinning, producing power, but not at full capacity, so that they can lose any one, any one asset. They can lose their largest one, their largest single asset, and everything else can pick up the slack. Uh, but they can't lose two <laughs> large assets at the same time. So I think that's, I'm, I'm assuming that was part of the problem. I think it's geographic. I think you can't get from here to there, say Chicago, unless you go through certain wires. And if that is interrupted, you can't go around. Right. That, well, that would cause regional problems. To bring down the whole country, you'd have to be very strategic about where those, those were. And, that's why there were nine instead of one, I guess. Yeah, right. Um, so this is a great picture. Actually, this is a this is, um, great lead-in. I love th So that's basically what our grid looks like. Um, and um, it's kind of an amazing machine. 
because it works. It's kind of amazing that it works. You know, if inside the computer, you, if you ever looked at a motherboard, it's, 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 a, it's a bunch of components connected by wires. And the whole continent is a bunch of components connected by wires, you know? So, and it all has to be synchronized. So we, we have the AC, you know, 60 cycles a second, the voltage reverses, and it maintains that perfect 60 cycles per second. Um, and if there's a voltage, uh, excuse me, frequency disturbance in Louisiana, people in Maine see the same frequency disturbance at the exact same time. The whole thing is synchronized. And if demand exceeds supply, the frequency drops a little. And if supply exceeds demand, the frequency increases a little. And so there, there's no warehouse, there's no inventory. And so this all has to be balanced, hence the pretty picture, in real time, instantaneously, over a whole continent. Uh, and if it gets out of balance, it crashes. It, you, know, as you can't, you know, you can go to, you can go to 59.9, and that's like in a big emergency in the utility control rooms. So it's, it's really amazing that the whole thing works in the first place, actually. Um, so let, what does this have to do with renewables? Let me, let's talk about renewables for a second. Um, and I like to think of sort of four eras. You know, the first era back in the 70s and 80s, you know, sort of tongue-in-cheek hippies and mad scientists. Um, actually, the history of the solar industry, you know, was originally the space program, and then um, the first sort of commercial terrestrial applications of solar energy was literally pot farmers from Humboldt County dumpster diving at JPL in Pasadena. Um, and then someone was like, well, wow, there's a market for this. And they, that's where Real Goods started and, and Jade Mountain, which is now Guyam right here in town, got its roots supplying pot farmers in, in Humboldt County. So, I don't know if I should be telling you, sorry. That's what I heard. <laughs> so that was, that was it. And we weren't taken seriously, you know, the renewable industry really wasn't taken seriously at all. And, and, I, and so I went to NREL because I wanted to do renewable energy and that was the only reputable place I could work, you know. Um, and then NREL got a director, oh, I don't remember exactly when, but we, when this was, we hired Admiral Truly. Um, and he was from Georgia Tech and he was an, literally was an admiral from Georgia. And, and he was probably a good director. But one of the things that re, he really had going for him is he could get up in front of an audience and he'd say, I'm Admiral Trudely, truly, and he had a good southern accent. And nobody was going to accuse him of being a, a hippie, you know? <laughs> so, so then we got the second era. And this is sort of where we're at now. It's, it's in, the, in the lower 48. It's mostly a tax shelter. You know, there's these really attractive tax incentives. And if you talk to the finance people, there's this whole industry called tax equity about financing these things because it's all about capturing the tax credits. The financial instruments that they've created are, are really complicated so that the person with the tax liability gets the, gets the tax credit. And, and the only certain people, there aren't that many people that have tax liabilities big enough for that to matter. And it's all very complicated. It's all about capturing that. It, so there's this whole industry with lots of transaction costs about c capturing the tax credits. But we're entering an era where this stuff makes sense on its own right. It's, 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 it doesn't need subsidies and, it, and incentives. We're not quite there yet in the lower 48, but we are there in other parts of the world in places like remote Alaska and islands all over the world, it's economic today without incentives, without tax credits. So that changes things entirely because uh, now, it has, now it's on the, on the verge of a real industrial takeoff. Um, so, so one of the things I want to talk about is where are those places where it's economic today, which it's not everywhere, you know, but it's certain places. And then what happens when you have this takeoff? when suddenly you have a lot of this solar and wind power on the grid. Um, that's, uh, it's a challenge. Uh, and, I, you know, I'm, I'm giving away my answer is you do it in stages. You don't try to do it all at once. So 
the place the, and the other simple answer to the question of where is it economic today, it's where they burn oil to make electricity. Because oil is several times more expensive than any other source of fuel. For, um, and you think, well, nobody burns oil to make electricity. I mean, if you talk to anyone in the power industry, they go, oh, no, we stopped doing that a long time ago, in the lower 48. But in remote places, they don't have any choice. They don't, they're not on a gas pipeline. They're not big enough. Coal plants have to be big. You can't economically create a, um, uh, a small coal plant. Nuclear plants have to be big. Hydro, you have to be in the right place for. So I mean, in most, place, most small places, oil is the only op choice they have. And it's five times the cost of gas. And there's a surprising amount of it. It's all in these obscure places that people don't think of, like villages in Alaska or islands. But there's a lot more of those than, than there's tens of thousands of inhabited islands around the world. There's 5 million barrels a, a day. That's 7% of global oil production goes to, into making electricity, or $180 billion a year. And none of it's really economic. It's all now can be replaced economically with renewables, or can be mostly replaced with, with renewables. So, well, the Saudis do it too, yeah. But they, but they, and they're wising up that that it they'd be better off uh, exporting the oil than using it. But they, yeah, and they also have they also charge their and the Venezuelans charge their citizens eleven cents a gallon for fuel. But that's really economically dumb for them to be doing that. But they're kind of stuck a little bit. So. So, I, so yeah, this is another way of looking at it, just showing how the price of, this is, this is a very simplified approach. This is really the marginal cost of just the, without looking at, there's a lot of costs that aren't going into this, but the trends are really clear. Diesel prices are going up, PV prices are coming down. PV prices have come down 75% in the last three or four years, have come down precipitously. Um, and this graph kind of shows that. So there, there's a train wreck coming. I don't know how often I should, I should let this one go. Turns out if you Google train wreck, if you, you get some really gruesome pictures. So uh, I, this, one, this one isn't too gruesome. OK, I'll move on. <laughs> so it motivated the. Um, well, we just came out with this report with the Rocky Mountain Institute on grid defection. And it was motivated by actually of all place, people or all organizations, the Edison Electric Institute a year ago um, came out with a report saying that the utilities were facing a, a huge challenge. And the Edison Electric Institute is sort of the lobbying and trade group for the utility industry. They're very, extremely conservative. It was, you know, there have been people talking about how solar is going to change the world for decades. And the utility industry has always been the naysayer. And now the Edison Electric Institute came out and said it. And that got a lot of attention. So we actually got the Rocky Mountain Institute, when they're kind of the leading proponents of energy efficiency, et cetera, and the, um, you know, this Amory Levins' uh, think tank based here in Colorado. Uh, but we also had the Electric Power Research Institute, which is the research group for the industry call us at the same time with the same question, which is, I hear you guys can model what it really costs to do off-grid power. Um, is, this, is this a real threat? Uh, so we, wrote, we came out with this report with uh, our RMI just a month ago, and it's evidently their most highly downloaded report they've ever done. And we're gonna have a webinar with them on the 23rd, which, I've got the URL there for if you want it. Um, so I'm not going to talk about it in a lot of detail, but basically they're saying, you know, if, if PV prices continue to fall, and more importantly, actually, if storage prices continue to fall, um, this actually does become a, a threat. Now, um, everybody's been crying wolf for a while, so we've been, I, I alluded to this, how People have been talking about how solar is a threat to the utility industry for decades. And this concept of the utility, um, I think it's my next slide, the utility death spiral. That if people start being more efficient with electricity, or especially if they start producing it on their own, 
then there's huge fixed costs associated with the, with the grid, with the, all those wires and the generators and everything else. And all the what? Bonds to but, pay for it? Yeah, right, right. Those are the fixed costs. Thousands of dollars of bonds that have to be paid. You're right. Less. Exactly. So you know about the death spiral. Yes. Yeah. So people have been talking about it for, for decades, and it's just like, you know, it, it sounded like crying wolf because they started talking about it 30 years ago, and for 25 years, it didn't happen, or it, it still hasn't quite happened. But now, it's starting to look like the utilities actually are kind of worried about this, because energy efficiency, we haven't, the, our demand in the US peaked in 2007. So we've got this economic recovery, but we're still, and the economy's recovered, based sort of, but electric demand hasn't. And now solar's kicking in in a big way. So, um, that might, it might actually start to happen now. So that they, they cry wolf and now nobody believes them. But there's another kind of crying wolf that's been happening. Um, it's a little more technical. Um, the utilities have been arguing for years that um, solar and wind were too variable, too intermittent, and that, that the grid can't absorb solar power. Oh, I, sh I should have waited a second before putting up the slide. But anyway, they've been saying, oh, no, no. You, the, and then we go, the, Folks at NREL and other analysts were saying, no, 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 there's the load's variable. You, the utility system can absorb the variability that's, the, that's inherent in people turning on lights and stuff all the time. And, and okay, okay, you can, we can absorb a little bit comparable to the variability of a load. So we can include 5%, no, but the, we can't do more than 10. Well, no, actually, it turns out, well, we can do more than We can't do more than 15 or 20. Or, so we, nobody really knows exactly where that constraint is. So they've been crying wolf about, no, this stuff's too intermittent, we can't, we can't handle this. Well, and it turns out, well, actually, you can handle it, but it's just like the boy who cried wolf, they actually do have a point that at, at, there is a point at which the grid can't handle more solar and, and wind without major re, restructuring, which is what we're talking about. And, but they're having a hard time getting people to believe them because they've been saying this for so long. But this is, so this is why I brought up, put up the slide. There's, there's several issues that uh, intermittent power, variable power, challenges it provides to the grid. And without going into all of them, I think this is the most significant one. So this is called the duck graph. And I, I, I drew this on the whiteboard in, in our office and, and because I said, because nobody had heard of the, uh, the duck graph. I thought, I thought everybody had heard of the duck graph. You know? And they said, no, what's a duck graph? So I drew that. And I said, doesn't that look like a duck? And uh, I, I guess I'm not a, that good a drawer. I, t you tell me, does that look like a duck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the deal is, wh what it's showing here is this is the load today. You know, so you know, people go to bed, it's low at night, it comes up in the daytime, uh, and then it comes up big time when people go home to cook in, in the evening, turn on TVs and stuff. And it, you know, regionally, it's different from, like, you know, this is, this is California. I don't know if it's the whole state. Um, I think this is like March in California or something like that. But anyway, the point is, is you start adding solar and you start depressing the daytime load. And two things happen. If, if you want this, these, this generators to be available in the evening, you can't turn them off in the daytime because the big generators, at least, don't turn on and off that easily. The little generators can turn on and off more easily. So, and, and if you're leaving them on, you can't have them idling. There's a minimum load. They, if, if, if they're going to be on, they, can, they have to be producing at least 50% of their capacity, or it's bad for them for various reasons. And it's inefficient, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, there's a, it's not just inefficient. It's, there's a technical constraint. So, so they've got a problem of, of, well, at this point, we've got excess energy. We're, it's, we, we, have to get, we have to throw it away. We have to curtail the solar. Or in econ speak, the marginal value goes to zero. We should just give it away, you know? Just the electric cars. If there were enough electric cars out there, it would work great. Or ice storage, if ice for cooling. Or, I mean, there's, so there are some solutions to this problem, but they involve change that isn't, you know, needs to happen. And then the other issue is that just as the sun's going down, people are turning appliances on. So you have this ramp here, which is kind of a related problem. 
is, but these aren't unsolvable problems, but they're not trivial problems either. They're, they're, and um, so what's the solution to these problems? Well, one solution is microgrids because for several reasons. One, like I mentioned, the smaller generators can turn on and off faster. A diesel generator can come on in, in 10 seconds. It's probably, you probably prefer to have a minute, couple of minutes, but a nuclear plant takes, you know, four or five, four days or something. And a, and a big coal plant takes, you know, better part of a, of a whole day. You can't, you, you can't turn them on and off. And there's a lot of work going on with gas plants to make them fast start, but for a, a gas plant to be considered fast start, it's like a half an hour. So that's still a big improvement, but, um, but little plants can go on and off much faster. And you can handle load management much better in a, in a microgrid. And you can, storage has more value in a microgrid because it's on the distributed, distri the, use, the user side of the distribution system. Um, so microgrids have this ability to manage that that um, the large grid doesn't have. So what do we mean? What, it's not a well-defined term, actually. So I should define what I mean by microgrid. Uh, and that's first bullet is it. Is it capable of operating on its own? So you can have a distributed power, like m almost all the rooftop solar you see around here, it's distributed power. But if the grid goes down, it goes down. It's, it doesn't, it's not capable of, of operating on its own. Uh, but it could, it just requires more electronics, it requires a little bit of storage at least, uh, and more controls and different kinds of electronics. Um, and, and that's becoming available. Uh, so and, so that now you're empowering consumers and you're allowing them to decide how much reliability do they really need. So if you're a data center, you want like quadruple redundancy. Or, you know, there's certain high-tech manufacturing facilities that need that kind of re redundancy and reliability. Um, and they pay through the nose for that. But the typical residents or, you know, most people wouldn't want to pay for the, through the nose for that. And people vary in how much they care about renewables. So a lot of people are, uh, really want, to, to want renewables, and they should, can have more of it if they want. And like, likewise, well, the next slide's about storage and load yeah. management. So, Navigant Research, I've got, a, Pat Pike Research became Navigant Research. They're, they're, they're market research company, they're based here in Boulder also, um, are uh, predicting, you know, a large market, large and fast growing market. So, so the key really are the storage and load management. PV is already inexpensive, uh, but like I said, without storage and load management, it's not a microgrid. It's just feeding power into the grid on an as available basis, but it's not, providing any flexibility to the grid, and um, it's storage and load management that do that. Um, so storage technologies are kind of the Achilles heel of the, of the systems. Uh, we, we had a conference that we sponsored last year, and uh, someone told me the best part of the conference, I, hate to, I shouldn't say it that way, but anyway, the, um, somebody got up there and said, uh, some little quote, liar, liar, battery supplier. <laughs> so, so there's, the batteries are kind of like, they're the weak link of the system and it's, uh, but they're, they're improving dramatically. And a lot of it's motivated by electric vehicles. The, the, that's for lithium batteries, you know, your laptop has, or your cell phone have lithium batteries and that's clearly the lightest, most energy dense kind of storage. But for a station application, you don't need that. So there's a lot of other, there's technologies too. There's zinc batteries and vanadium batteries and there's flywheels and there's batteries made out of salt. And every day I see a new, some new thing and most of them aren't gonna pan out, but there's so many new ideas being developed that uh, it's pretty clear one of, I don't know which one to be honest, but one of those is gonna pan out. And, and actually the, the progress that's just been made in lithium batteries is, is remarkable really. So storage is improving. It's still, it will always probably be the weak link, but it's, it, 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 you know, as long, it, but it's improving dramatically. Uh, and it's, its value is much higher when it's distributed because that's how you get the reliability. You know, and that's like, it's a UPS for your home or your, or, you know, if, if the, the difference between a laptop and a desktop, this has a little bit of storage in it. So when there's an outage, nothing happens. When, if on your desktop, you lose whatever you're working on. 
Actually, the first computer I worked on uh, so long ago, if there was a power of, the, the disks would crash. You'd, there'd literally be physical damage if somebody didn't run down to the computer center and, and, and get, and I don't know exactly what they had to do, but prevent the heads from crashing on the disk if there was a power failure. So, um, and it's all solved by putting the storage right next to the load. So you put the storage next to the load. That's distributed microgrids. Uh, there's also, I mean, it's a little technical, but it, it can provide other values too, like stabilizing the voltage at the end of the grid, et cetera, things like that. Um, and then load management is mostly information technology. It's mostly uh, controls, software, communication. It's all stuff that um, is leaps and bounds ahead of where the power industry is now. I mean, that's all, technology has, has evolved so rapidly there, and the utility industry isn't taking advantage for the most part. I mean, it's just starting to, but, but a great quote, if, um, if uh, Alexander Graham Bell were reincarnated and looked at our communication system, he wouldn't recognize the thing. If Thomas Edison were reincarnated and looked at our power system, he'd recognize everything. He'd go, wow, I know what that is, I know what that is. Nothing's really changed, slight exaggeration, but not that much of an exaggeration. So there's this enormous opportunity to use information technology um, and waiting for the big utilities to do it is just, wait, is just gonna be a long wait. And you know, they, get, they get beat up a lot for being so conservative and so, um, but really they're responsible for keeping the lights on. That super complicated machine there uh, that's their job, and they're responsible for these long-lived assets. These, uh, they, there's a reason they're conservative, and we've created a whole regulatory structure around that. Uh, and and if they want to make any changes, they got to get approval from the regulators. They've got to, got to listen to all the stakeholders. You've got to, and it gets very political. And and if the and if they screw up, it gets everybody's really angry. Uh, and, it, and for good reason. I mean, the last big regulatory change, you know, the California deregulation, deregulation, whatever, didn't go very well. Um, so there's a reason they're that conservative. And, and so I don't really begrudge them being conservative. I, um, but if you want innovation, you've got to go around them. Um, so uh, there, and there is a lot of innovation that's possible with applying information technology to the way we use energy. Uh, and who do you want to do that? Do you want, so the more local it is, like in your home, you decide what appliances go on and off, or if you're in an industrial park or campus, those are the typical microgrid applications. Um, that's one owner, and they make these decisions for themselves. And there's some, you know, it, it means deciding what's a curtailable load, what's a controllable load. Am I, is it okay if the, it's to adjust the thermostat based on the availability of power? You know, is it okay to change the way we use power based on its availability? So somebody's got to make those, those, those decisions. Um, so when we th talk about this, this, the smart grid or the super smart grid or smart super grid or whatever, um, I, I really don't think the, the, expecting it to come through the large utilities is realistic. They've got these security issues, regulatory issues, but what you're seeing is these smaller systems, it's already happening because they're, they're burning diesel fuel. They've got this economic imperative, really, to up, use renewables. So they're going to renew, renewables quickly, getting to the, what we call high penetrations quickly, where this managing that variability becomes really important, really challenging, and they're figuring out, Steve's one of the pioneers here, figuring this out, how to do this, actually, thank you for coming, um, in these Alaskan villages. So these little Eskimo villages, in the middle, truly, in the middle of nowhere, I mean, you, you, it's mind-boggling how remote these places are. And they've got like a wireless network where as the wind goes up and down, the power to the heaters goes up and down real time throughout the village. Right, so that's the smart grid. It's already happening in obscure places that burn oil. And so they're, they're leading the, the charge and nobody really even knows what's going on. Um, and they're not used to being cutting edge. They need a lot of help, actually, to do that. Um, 
So where are the microgrids? What, what, what are, and I started thinking about, wow, there's all these different kinds of microgrids and how to, so I, how to map out this space. So I, and so this way I did it. I, I decided, well, there's three value drivers, reliability, fuel savings, and sort of environmental values. And, the, and each one of these little market niches has sort of a different uh, mix of motivation, if you will. So the military is really interested in microgrids. We're working with the Office of Naval Research for Marines, forward operating bases for Marines. And because they're, they measure fuel risk in lives. Three quarters of the casualties in Iraq and Afghanistan were related to co fuel convoys, fuel and water convoys. Three quarters of the casualties. So they, they don't have a history of thinking economically. They are all about the tip of the spear, get the mission, you know, um, what is the term they use? But um, nothing should sacrifice their, their mission. Nothing should, um, but now it turns out actually fuel vulnerability is, 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 is it got, when they started thinking about not the, the lives that they were losing and their, how it was restricting their ability to, to, to do their job, that they're taking this really seriously. Um, so that's the forward operating bases. They're kind of leaders. It's a, small, it's a smaller circle because the big military bases like Fort Carson are way bigger. They don't burn oil, so it's, they're not going to do it. They're not going to get there as quickly. It's not quite as, it's not as economic, but it's, they're bigger. And, they, and, they're try, they're, and they're more difficult, too. So they're, but they're, they're, they're serious about it. They're really trying. And emergency services, you know, these Superstorm Sandy and Katrina, and all these, and Irene, and all these storms have really woken up. The, so the Northeast Corridor is, is suddenly become a hotbed of, of interest in microgrids. So, uh, so we've got a project with the state of Massachusetts to, to look at 40 municipalities and try to define their, and what are their emergency, critical services, and, what, and how can microgrids um, make them resilient. And same with New Jersey. Conne Connecticut's actually the leader. But they're all right there together. Um, so that's the reliability piece. Um, the places that burn diesel are the places that where it's, it's all about fuel savings. I mean, some of these island nations, 25% of their GDP is for, goes to imported oil. So they're, and, and that, that cost has gone up by a factor of four or so in the last few years. I mean, they're, they're facing, they're, well, they're facing a climate change challenge for the low-lying islands, but even though, even ignoring that, they're facing an economic catastrophe with the, just the, the vulnerability they of to oil prices. So they're, they're real interested. Mines is kind of an interesting one because it's, um, they burn a lot of diesel fuel, the remote mines. Uh, there's a project in the Northwest Territories, a diamond mine. I don't know if you heard about this diamond mine in Northern Canada. Um, they're burning 50 million gallons of diesel fuel a year that all has to be trucked up there. It's an incredible operation they've got. I should have gotten a picture of it. So they, they're putting in, they put in wind turbines. They had, those wind turbines had to be trucked from the Hudson Bay 3,000 kilometers over ice roads, over like, you know, not real roads um, that could only, you can only drive in the winter time up there. Uh, and and this, these are full scale, full size wind turbines. Like the, I mean, you've seen those blades on the highway here? That's like the largest object you can take on a highway are the blades for a wind turbine. They trucked them 3,000 miles on a Jeep trail, on, not, not even a Jeep trail, an ice road, to, to, because the saving diesel fuel is so valuable. The problem with mines, though, so it's not, not an issue for the diamond mine. They, they're kind of confident they're going to be there for a long time. But a lot of mines depend on commodity prices. And they don't, you know, so the, the price of gold goes down, they shut down mines. You know, and they're opening and shutting down mines all the time. So, you don't really want to invest in a big renewable project if your load might shut down. But so you have to find, but the mines that are confident they're going to stay in production for a long time are looking at renewables really, really thoroughly. I actually think the environmental issue is probably the biggest long-term one, the climate change issue. And if we ever get serious about that, uh, we're not really serious about it yet. So it, as a market, it's not really happening quite yet. It's probably the biggest long-term one. And the one that people don't talk about very much, except for me, <laughs> In developing countries, the, the grid is so unreliable in a lot of the developing countries 
that everybody who can afford it has a backup generator. And they hate them. You know, and they, but then they use them enough that the diesel fuel is a problem. Uh, and so, um, but it, the, to, to work in those places, you need something really robust, packaged, reliable, you know, just easy to deploy. You can't be custom engineering stuff. What? Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, I did say people hate them. I didn't say why. <laughs> yeah, no, they're, then they're noisy, right? In a lot of places, the power shuts off during school hours because it's a, because it's, it's because of the noise. Um, so anyway, uh, so this Pike Research is now Navigant Research, and they came up with this this uh, yeah they do these market projections just to say that I'm not the only one that thinks this is the future. Um, uh, so what's what's holding it back? What's the problem? You, the, the, well, there's I mean, there's a, it's new, uh, and so people have to figure it out. It's also very site specific. What's the right solution for a particular place depends on where you are, how big is your load, all that. What are your resources there? And then there's all this new technology. So so you you wouldn't believe how often we get calls from people with the some newfangled thing, you know. Um, um, actually, the best one are the folks at the National Wind Technology Center, just out of town. Um, small wind attracts this, because it's pretty easy to build a wind turbine, a small wind turbine. So there's all kinds of people coming out with newfangled small wind turbines that, that, then they, that they, and then they go to the National Wind Technology Center, why don't you test this thing? And they go, well, because, it's clearly jerry-rigged and, you know, clear, you know, whatever. But anyway, so there's all this new technology out there, and it's pretty confusing, and it's, and it's not clear what's, wh who's the winner, what's, what, what, should you, um, what should people use. So that's, that's where we come in to answer this question, what's best? And the, unfortunately, the answer is it depends. No, nobody wants to hear that. You know, what you want really to, I mean, ideally, the, the reason the, Henry Ford was successful is because he had a one-size-fits-all. You, you want it in any color as long as it's black, right? Some cookie-cutter solution, um, and that's just not the way it's going to be. And, and so you have all these different technologies, that are, and they're all different, and you have this flexibility in design, which sounds good. You know, you can custom design it for people. But it it's actually makes things more confusing. It's, it, it would, and, but it's just the way it is. So we looked at that and said, the, this industry is never going to take off unless there's an easy way to sort through what makes sense where. Uh, so that's, what our soft, that's why we designed the software. That's our, that's our role in the world, is to fit the pieces together. Uh, because it is going to be site specific. Uh, and and it's you know it would be, be nice if we could move towards package systems, especially for smaller systems. Um, and and it, 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 there's a whole industry, the power power project power developers that build power projects, and they're and they're really good at building hundred million dollar projects, hundred million big power plants. And they got professional engineers and the finance community. They all like to. If, you, if it's a big project, you can afford the transaction costs, et cetera, of, of the, all that d custom engineering. But for smaller projects, you can't afford that. So that's the, the key here is an efficient development process. So just a little more about the software. We look at all the different kinds of renewable resources, but also conventional resources. We, we, we focus more on the smaller ones, um, storage and load management, as I've said. So this is a screenshot of how, this, how it, you know, what it looks like. So then I thought, no, I don't. Oh. Um, so then I thought I'd just show some pictures of some microgrids around the world. Um, so this is one we developed in Baja, Mexico, a remote fishing village. Uh, it's got wind and PV, diesel generator. I didn't mention the storage. That's too bad because I don't. I was, I've been there, but I don't remember now how big the battery bank was. Um, and then Kotzebue, which is way out on the, 
near the Bering Strait, um, is, is a real leader in this. So they, they put in, and this isn't even up to date, they're putting in more wind turbines. So they, they, uh, they've got several different vintages uh, that they've been installing. They're, they're one of the large, is it larger, they're called Mahub communities. There's 200 remote communities in Alaska that rely on diesel. And there's about six of these hub communities that are sort of regional hubs. I mean, so a large community in, in rural Alaska is like 4,000 people or 6,000 people or something like that. Um, so Kotzebue is a real leader. This is one of the smaller communities, but no. Uh, well, they, they, they're, they can't rely on their neighbors, so they have excess capacity. So a typical, in, here in the lower 48, a utility, actually there's sort of requirements by the North American Electric Reliability Council that they need to have something like 15 or 20 percent reserve capacity, excess capacity. Uh, but in remote, but, but that's because if, in, they can always rely on their neighbor. I mean, actually, if their unit goes down, they will automatically, without anyone doing anything, power will flow in from the neighbors. And then they have to make up for that. There's all kinds of issues, you know. But, um, but th that's not an option there. So they have lots of excess capacity uh, because units are on maintenance, units break, uh, and, and, and it's kind of a life and death thing in Alaska. If, if the power goes out in the middle of winter, it's, it's, you know, it's bad. So they have excess capacity, lots of excess capacity. And some of it is really old also, like they, you know, but it's, they keep it around for backup. So this is a smaller one, um, another one, I uh, like Alaska. This one's interesting because it's a mix of hydro and wind. So that's um, theoretically can be a really good synergy because when the wind blows, you keep the water in the reservoir and then that acts kind of like storage. Um, Kodiak, Alaska has that, but it turns out that the, uh, it's a technical issue, that it's, it's not as effective as storage as, as, you'd, as you'd hope because of the, the way it's configured. Uh, so here's a, the military and the U.S. Navy. They're, so they're kind of a leader as well. So there's several of these islands now off California. You've worked on one, right? Didn't you? No one. Oh, shh. Okay, never mind. <laughs> um, this is a, another military one. This is a US, UK. Ascension Island was um, where the, during the Falklands War was the halfway between Britain and the Falkland Islands. It's, so it's way, again, these places are way out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and those are just some examples. Actually, that, that's kind of, in the last few years, the number of these islands that have moved to this has increased dramatically. So I don't have a slide on this, but we're working with the Carbon War Room. It's, um, it's Richard Branson's NGO, um, and he's got this 10 island challenge. <coughs> so the carbon war room is his idea of the, that responding to the carbon challenge, the climate challenge, is the next great entrepreneurial challenge or opportunity. And uh, so he's got these, um, what do you call them, In initiatives. Most of them are for big stuff, airline industry, the shipping industry, et cetera. But um, he's got a special thing for islands. He's, he owns a couple islands in the, in the British Virgin Islands. And uh, we've been working with him for several years and convinced, you know, our story is it's not just about how much carbon emissions, these, they don't emit that much carbon in the global scale of things, but they are kind of the most vulnerable communities. But more importantly, they are, like the point I've been trying to make, they are the ones that are going to, demonstrate to the world, you can do renewables at high penetration, and you can make it work, and you can have a stable grid. And they're, because the economics are so compelling, they're, they're gonna be the ones that go first, even though culturally they've never gone first on, on anything before. If you, had, if you grew up on an island and you were ambitious, you left, <laughs> you know? So anyway, they've got this 10 island challenge, and Aruba is, is island number one. They've, they've got a, a 15 mega, no, excuse me, 30 megawatt wind farm. Uh, their peak load is around 100 megawatts, so that's substantial to begin with. They're doubling it as we speak. They're putting in more solar. They're experimenting with flywheels with um, a very novel storage 
technology where they're mooring um, un underwater compressed air, compressed air underwater storage. So they're pumping air down to, uh, to containers on the seabed, which are pressurized from the weight of the water. And um, so that's, they're taking a leadership position. That, that's just, they're pretty unusual. So they're island number one. His personal island his, is island number zero, Necker Island. Uh, and we, you know, we had a big event down there and we got the got, uh, prime ministers from other Caribbean islands to come and there was a little bit of peer pressure. So now we've got St. Lucia, Grenada, British Virgin Islands, Turks and Caicos, Cayman Islands. I always miss some. Colombia has a couple of islands in the Caribbean. Um, I may be missing some. So he's got this 10 island challenge. So the momentum's starting to happen and, and it's starting to happen in these obscure parts of the world. Russia has 3,000 remote diesel powered villages. Now I don't really know how to work in Russia, right? but eventually that will be a big market too. Um, so then um, this one is a very interesting one. Um, because this was 1997, this probably was the first. And this is an island in the Bering Sea. And so it's got a great wind resource. Uh, and it also has the daytime high in July. The average daily high in July is 45 degrees. So they have a heating load every 12 months a year. So they can run diesel off. They can run 100% renewable, not for the whole year, but for weeks at a time because they have excess wind that they use for heating. And, you, and heating is a very controllable load. It's not a very high value load because there's, you wouldn't want to burn fuel just to make power just to, for electricity. But, but if you have excess electricity, so they can keep the grid stable just by very quickly varying the amount of power going into the heat, which is now, well, actually has become common across Alaska, but they were the first in 1997, I think. So they were the kind of... Yeah, yeah, it's right. Right, right, so they, and that, they all do that. They, they take the waste heat off the diesel. The, the irony is when you start installing wind, you're starting to use the diesel less, you're, less getting, you're getting less heat from the diesel. So it becomes, a, this is why optimization, it's why you need a software like we have, right? Because it's kind of complicated, all the trade-offs there. So I, I'm pretty much done. This is Wales, Alaska, that, that's one of Steve's projects. This is where man first set foot in North America, actually, if it's, this is, so, so that's, yeah, you can see Russia right there. <laughs> Theoretically, I think you can actually on a clear day. Yeah, right, you can, on a clear day. Anyway, so that's the whole town. This is this whole town, and these are, these are snow drifts off the houses. This is this, this, oh, summer, winter, it's kind of a, anyway. So, and then just some other studies we did. Show, this is in Hawaii, showing you, you, add, you start with no wind, and this is how much fuel they use. You add different, more and more wind, and then eventually you get to a point where it gets, Diminishing returns, it gets, you start needing a lot of storage to get that last little bit. So getting to 20% is easy, getting to 50% is, is, is possible with you know, a little bit of controls, et cetera, whatever, it's not, it's not super easy, but it's totally doable. Getting to 80% is a, is a challenge. Um, getting beyond 80% starts getting really prohibitive. That's where you want biofuels. If you, if you want to be 100% renewables, you're gonna, the last 20% have to be like biofuels or something. So. Distributed power, it's my passion in life, and, and it's gonna happen, and it's gonna happen for these reasons. It's the only way to provide real reliability, to really guarantee reliability and security and resilience, and et cetera. It has environmental benefits. We mentioned combined heat and power. That even if you're using f fossil fuels, you're using them twice as efficiently if you can utilize the waste, the waste heat. But you can't use, utilize the waste heat from a centralized plant because it's too much heat. You can't, you can't pipe it far enough. It has to be close to where you need the heat. So, uh, and, and the economics is, it depends where you are. It's getting better everywhere, but it, right now we're focusing on the place where it's really economic and it's, that's just going to improve as time goes on. Um, what I didn't talk about that much, and it's the subject of this RMI report, 
and part two is in process, is what, how, how should the utility industry respond to this? Bit, no, whole nother topic. Um, and, it's good, and it's not gonna happen overnight. People would like things to change overnight. I would like things to change overnight, but it's not gonna happen overnight. It's gonna happen in stages. So it's gonna make for an interesting time. So I, I did use up a whole hour. I'm, I guess I can just talk, you know. <laughs> but if I'm, I, I, is there any questions or anything? Gas prices have um, come down because of shale gas, and that's been a real challenge to renewable developers trying to re develop renewable projects in the lower 48. No, there's no question about that. Um, Yeah, right, so I try not to do that, actually. <laughs> the, um, I mean, w w yeah, um, I'm not an expert on shale gas, on, on oil and geology, et cetera. Uh, and so there's a lot of reasons why I prefer working in remote areas, uh, and that's one of them. You know, it's not the only one, but, um, and, and, it, and it's also why I see renewable developers starting to take an interest in these more difficult projects. Um, what, how do you see uh, superconductors uh, impacting this and uh, much more efficient transmission? Um, well, superconductors are useful for all kinds of things. Uh, um, you know, trans, the loss, the, t the, 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 the drawback to the transmission system isn't really the losses. It's about the total amount of energy lost through transmission and including distribution is like 7%. So it's something, it's not nothing. Um, superconductors have a lot of potential. Um, I'm tempted to punt that one back to, that's, uh, yeah, I, it's not, I don't, <laughs> All right, let's give Peter a big round of applause here. Thanks. <laughs>